Okay, my clock says seven o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm excited because this is my 30th week of doing the my free Q and A's, and so that's pretty fun. I was looking just this week to see how many I have been doing, and I was surprised that it has already been 30. So that's pretty exciting. I think uh, it's been longer than 30 weeks because we haven't been on every single night, every single Thursday night. But it's uh, this is the 30th one that will be recorded, which is uh, on YouTube and ready to go. So that's pretty great. And here we go to the next slide. We're going to um, look at a few things. I just want to be really clear. There are eight ways that I can help you grow food. My YouTube channel, my Zoom, my Zoom free Q&A, my Patreon class. And I have 410 videos plus because I put out several every week. Some weeks I put out as many as five. The last few weeks I've been putting out a little bit less. But that is me and my garden or my laboratory teaching people how to grow food. And then I have my 17-week farmer career training course, teaching people how to have a career in growing food. And then I'm a laboratory to help you test your soils to make sure that the microbes are thriving and all the creepy crawlies down there in the soil are making your soil function. And then I'm also available for consulting. If you're a full-time farmer, if you're starting a farm, or if you just want to feed your family the best food ever, I do consulting. I have my boot camp classes that I do, and they're pretty awesome. Those are either two or three day events. A group of people come here to my home and we go into my garden and we get dirty and I teach you how to grow food. And you have to clean your fingernails when we're done because we actually do the work and you go home learning how to do your own garden. And my book is in manuscript form. It's done, I'm finished writing it and it is in the publication process right now. So that is pretty exciting. And for more information about that, my website is www.georgicrevolution.com to find out more. And we have a couple of events that are coming up. These are updated on my website. So if you go to my website right now, you can see what is happening here at Apricot Cottage and what we are doing to help the world have the best food ever. So winter boot camp. I've never done a winter boot camp before. This will be the first one. It's going to be the middle of January, January 19, 2021. So in a couple of months, we're going to have a boot camp. You will come here. You will stay on the farm for three days, and we will go into the greenhouse. And this will be a focus on gardening in the wintertime because that is something that not everybody does. There's a lot of people who can grow a beautiful garden. They don't always grow a winter garden. So we are doing something unique and different. Tell your friends and family, promote this and let's get people here. I only take about 15 people. So when this fills up, you have to wait till next winter because I'm only gonna do one this winter if you want the winter boot camp. My other thing that's happening that's coming up this will be next summer, but this is all updated and ready to sign up is the 17 week course. I already have my first sign up and I only take about seven students for this. So if you want to get in on this, you better figure out what your schedule is for next summer. And I would love to mentor you. Go to my website listed here at the bottom of the page and the details are there so that you can see what we are doing. And I put a lot of details on the website so that you can see what we're actually doing. And if you need have questions, call me, go to my contact page on the website, give me a call, we can talk on the phone. Okay, so tonight's subject are the seven th major things that we talk about in the third month of our 17 week uh, farmer training program. So a couple of weeks ago, we went through the first things that are the first month. And then last time we met was the second month. This night, we're going to briefly talk about the things we talk about in the third 
month. This is the focus. So when you come to this class, here's what we talk about. If you don't come to the class, this is why we're doing this on the free class so that you can still get some benefit from this. So number one, we really focus on the elements of a functioning ecosystem. Now, this isn't necessarily the elements of a functioning soil or the elements of a functioning farm or the elements of a functioning, and you could fill in the blank, about 20 different things. This is specific to ecosystems. And there are seven major layers that you need in an ecosystem to maximize the ecological principles, and things like sunlight and things like the water cycle, um, the mineral cycle, and taking advantage of ecological succession. If you have these seven layers of plants in place on your own property, then you can maximize the, the ecology that is available. Because if we just have sand, if we plow up the field and it's nothing but sand, we kill everything out there, we don't replant, we don't water, and it's just a fallow field, we are not taking advantage of the rain when it comes because we're not growing anything. We're not taking advantage of the mineral cycle because nothing is mineralizing. We're not creating anything. We're not taking advantage of anything else that mother nature could give us because nothing's happening there. So the way to maximize that are these seven layers of plants. If we only have one layer of plants, then we're getting one seventh of what we could get. So we wanna maximize by having all seven layer of plants on the same piece of ground. We often see this in forest systems. The Permaculture Institute, there, that's where I got this list of seven um, layers is from the Permaculture Institute, but they uh, have identified these seven layers and it's pretty awesome to be able to look at this closely and to understand it. So what is an overstory tree? Overstory trees are the big, tall trees. They're your biggest, your tallest trees. Think of the giant oak trees. Think of giant redwood trees. Think of something that's really big, beeches, birches, um, even quaking aspens that get really big could be overstory trees. So an overstory tree is a large tree. It's a big tree. And depending on what you're doing with the land, you could choose early succession pioneer species of trees, or you could choose the, the later succession long-lived trees, trees that maybe when they're 100 years old, they're just getting started. You know, think of the redwoods, man. Those guys are, they're thousands of years old. So 100-year-old redwood trees, baby. Um, let's move on to number two, the understory trees. What is an understory tree? Think of a fruit tree. An understory tree is a shorter tree. It's uh, closer to the ground. It doesn't get as tall. And it's called understory because it's under the overstory. So you've got your big shade trees up above. And then you would have smaller trees down below. But they would be species that would still do okay underneath a big tree. So on to number three, the shrub layer. Shrubs would be smaller plants. Think of something like an elderberry bush. It's it's bigger than just a, like a, a you know, because elderberries can get six, eight feet high. So an elderberry bush is a, a good example of a shrub layer. But there's a lot of different plants that could fill the niche of the shrub layer. Uh, number four, the herbaceous layer. These are plants that are going to grow up. And some of these might be as big as a shrub, but an herbaceous layer, when the winter comes and freezes everything, the plant material dies back to the ground. Okay. If it doesn't die back to the ground and the, and the branches come up and they stay alive, except the leaves fall off, but next spring, the leaves um, and flowers sprout out of those branches that stayed above the ground, that would be a shrub layer. But if it's an herbaceous layer, then those are your plants that are growing and they could be anywhere from a foot high to five, six, maybe even eight feet tall, depending on the species. But uh, the shrubs and herbaceous layers are similar. 
except for that big difference of how they um, overwinter. Number five, the ground cover layer. These are, this is something, the easy way to explain this is like a lawn. Your lawn is certainly a ground cover. And there's a lot of species that would be a ground cover, hundreds and hundreds of them. But if you go out into your garden and you look down and you see dirt, you have a problem. The ground should be covered. So number six is the root layer. And the root layer, we need to focus on our fibrous roots and our tap roots. You want both of those in that root layer going down in the ground. And then the vine layer, this is a very interesting layer and group of plants because these are the plants that are going to climb up anything that is tall, like your understory trees and your overstory trees. Some of the vine layer plants are gonna grow a long ways. Some of those may be able to get 50 feet tall. I don't know, maybe a hundred feet tall, certain species in the jungle. Uh, and But think of grapes. Grapes will climb and vine and grow way up into your um, into trees. That's the way they are found in nature. So the fun thing about these seven layers of plants is that you can find edible things that will produce really good food in every one of these layers. So you could have one of these layers in your um, garden and <laughs> with that one layer, you're gonna have a benefit. You add in a second layer, you're gonna double the benefit. A third layer, you're gonna triple the benefit. At some point, depending on the combination of the species you have, your climate, the microbes in the in in that system and all of the other animals and birds fish all all the creatures in this system there will come a point when you start getting maybe it could happen with two layers usually about four or five layers it becomes exponential so one layer you get a benefit two layers you're going to get a couple of benefits but at layer four or five and six you're not getting four times five times and six times the benefit you're gonna start getting um, eight times, 20 times, 60 times the benefit. If you have a very beautiful, vibrant, thick and luscious uh, with like ecosystem with all seven layers in place and a great diversity of each of these. So your overstories, you may want 20 species or if you have a if you have a thousand acre ranch, you should have closer to a hundred species. Uh, but you want lots of diversity. And when you get to that point where you have an amazing amount of stuff, you could have a thousand time benefit. You could go out there and you could start counting all kinds of benefits. Imagine walking out there every day of the year, even in a northern climate where there's two feet of snow on the ground. Every day of the year, you can walk through that forest and you can find fresh food to eat. Now, does that sound insane? Well, it's not because there's going to be a beautiful root layer all over the place and you can dig down through the snow and you could pull out those roots that are in there. Um, you, there's just a lot of things that are going to happen. And that's just one weird example. It's kind of a far-fetched example of a benefit, but there are so many benefits. There's going to be benefits of nutrition, benefits of um, rainfall, like if you had a big area, you could change the rain cycle. Your water cycle could be improved because of this. Your fertilizer would will be a thing of the past. This You're going to be creating your own soil fertility. So having these seven layers is very, very important. We certainly stress this in our 17-week course, and we spend a lot of detail on learning this and how this interacts with whatever kind of uh, environment we're trying to create. <laughs> Let's move on to number two, ecosystem processes maximized. And that's what a lot of that, I'm not gonna talk about this a lot tonight because I just barely talked about it quite a bit. By having these seven layers, we're maximizing those ecosystem processes that I already talked about, all right? A water cycle, ecological succession, and 
uh, what are the other two? Somebody needs to, one of you students needs to turn your mic on and answer these for me. The mineral cycle, and there's one more, who can answer it? Everybody's being shy. Water cycle, ecological succession. I can't pronounce that tonight. I'm adding three syllables. I, I went the to energy Jamaica. cycle. Say it again, Zeke. The energy cycle. Yeah, sunlight. Absolutely. Good job. So by maximizing those ecosystem processes, it makes us rich. It makes us wealthy. And so when there are poor people in our communities, there are problems with a lot of things but one of the big problems is if we create deserts and there's been a lot of man-made deserts over the world the course of the world so number three we need long-term planning to restore the most abundant ecosystems now i think that maybe some of the most abundant ecosystems are not the most abundant anymore because they are desertifying and it's, it is becoming a problem in the world. So how do we plan for that? <laughs> because we are kind of in the dark as a human race. If we think, oh, these are great ideas, and then we go outside and we just do start doing a lot of gardening. This is where we really need some higher education to know what to do, because if we go out there and just try to figure it out, it can take a lifetime. And the best scientists out there, it has taken them a, a majority of their lifetime and a lot of other people's uh, um, work to figure this out. And two of the people that I love who've done this are Alan Savory and Bill Mollison. And so we focus on this in our 17 week course in our third month, because when you understand holistic planning, which is what Alan Savory's planning is called, and he wrote a book called Holistic Management, and there's a whole Alan Savory Institute that you can learn from. But when you understand his principles, he takes very complicated ideas and he explains it in the way that small humans under 12 years old can go out there and actually do it. We don't need to have PhDs, masters, bachelor's degrees to grow food in a way that exponentially makes the ecology better for us in later years and for next generations. So holistic planning is very good. And then of course, there's Bill Mollison who created permaculture. And uh, the what he did with the ecological part of his work, I absolutely love. And there's a couple of things about Al, what Alan Savory has said, I don't agree completely. And there's a couple of things about what Bill Mollison said that I don't agree with completely. But those are not points of discussion for our class tonight. Both of them had to do with uh, uh, population control of humans. And I don't, and what they were saying made sense from a scientific point of view, but I come from a different world view. And so I don't really agree with their, what they said. But as far as they talk about ecology, I don't find any flaws in what they say. Number four. The more we can incorporate the seven layers of plants into food production, planning, and design, the better. You are going to find it hard if you're if you're going to start a, a business growing two crops. You're going to grow celery and let's just say a different one. Let's just say spinach. You're going to grow these two crops because there's a big need for it in your community, and you are good at those crops, and you can make a living at it. It's not a bad thing to do. So that's your deal. It's hard to incorporate that type of a, a business model and incorporating those seven layers. But let me tell you, if you can incorporate the benefits of the ecology, meaning you actually plant the seven layers and your ecosystem is functioning, and then you have a little bit more land within that same area where you're focusing on your two cash crops, then those cash crops are going to have better nutrition, better flavors, and they're going to uh, max out on nutrition. That is just what we have been finding in the research that the best scientists have been doing. So that's an important thing to think about. You actually want to incorporate 
as many of the seven layers as possible, even if you're doing a monocrop for a, for a cash crop to sell. Okay, number five. The age range of species in an ecosystem should be widespread. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that if you walk out into your property, and, and of course, we're assuming that you have these seven layers in place with this number five, okay? So you walk out on your property, you're looking at your plants, and you have beech trees that are 150 years old because somebody started these seven layers 150 years ago, and you can't find any beech tree under 75 years old. So for 75 years, a beech tree has not grown. This indicates something. This indicates that you don't have any infant or young age range of that particular species. So when you walk out in your particular ecosystem or your property to understand if it's healthy or not, and let's go with healthy first, if it's healthy, it's gonna have old, mature, young, and infant. It's gonna have all those. If it's not healthy, you may find that your old plants are dying. Or you may find that your infants are dying or, or they're not even there, they're, they've never sprouted. What if you go out there and you have very old and you have infants? Well, it means that in the last few years, something has become healthier and now they're starting to grow again. And in the interim, there was something happening in the, the management, the climate, there was, some, there was some kind of a, you know, a stimulus that made those things not grow. So all these things should be growing all the time. So you should be able to have age ranges. Number six, I like this principle, produce more than you consume. Okay, produce more than you consume. And this is a quote by Bill Mollison, and I really like that. And that was kind of his whole thing for his whole point of all the permaculture work he did to create the whole idea of permaculture is that he saw human beings consuming more than they produced. And that's what creates deserts. That's what kills the creation that God created. So uh, number seven, there are the four key insights of Alan Savory. And we can incorporate these into any system that we are dealing with if it is happening in the natural world. So a garden, a rangeland, a monocrop, um, a thriving, beautiful food forest with all seven layers doing very well. We can understand these four key insights in any of those places. And so here they are, just right there they are, the predator prey, um, timing, wholeness, and brittleness. So the predator prey relationship just it, it's a specific thing we need to understand so that we know how to move animals at the right time so that they do the thing that makes the ecology healthy. And then timing. Timing is very important because if your timing is wrong or if it is off and it it does like say you want the grass to grow really beautiful, but you keep bringing the cows back every seven days to mow it well they're going to kill out that grass and it'll become a desert so you need to time it differently you can't time it by the calendar you have to time it by what the plants actually are doing the plants have to be able to grow back a certain number of leaves and they'll do that on a different time scale depending on the time of year because if it's hot in the summer they grow in super fast but if it gets super hot in the very peak of summer they will slow down growth and then in the early spring, late fall, they slow down quite a bit because it's cold. And in the winter, they stop growing altogether. So if we're if our timing is by the calendar, it's going to be all messed up. It has to be according to plants. And then number three is wholeness. And that means the whole ecosystem works as a single organism. 
and so there are holes within holes within holes. So uh, what does that even mean? What it means is that your garden is going to be affected by other things that are maybe 30 feet away. It may be affected by your grass. It will be affected by a shade tree. It'll be affected by a deer that comes through and chomps your lettuce down. So the whole system works together. And then within that system, let's think about a migratory uh, pest insects that might migrate for uh, two or 300 miles. When they're coming through, now our system is maybe a thousand miles big. And so there's a bigger hole that we're dealing with. And then if we think about the rain cycle, well, the rain forms way out there. You know, what happens in Hawaii affects the rainfall in North America. And we need to kind of be aware of some of these things. So there's a much bigger ecosystem. Now we're talking about thousands and thousands of miles. And it goes to the point where we realize that the entire Earth is an ecosystem. We have an Earth ecosystem. And it's not just one single organism. And the last one is brittleness. And brittleness is, is uh, understanding brittleness is, is used as a tool in order to know what to do. Because if I am in a brittle environment and I manage my farm one way, and then I pack up all my belongings, I sell my farm, I move to a very non-brittle environment, and I keep managing the same way, I will fail. So our management has to change according to the scale of brittleness where we find ourselves living and breathing and working and managing our farms and ranches and our food production systems. So this is a quick overview of the major things we're focusing on in our 17-week course on the third month. And so there's some fun things here. And uh, let's just go to the next slide. So now I'm opening this up for questions. And we don't, this slide is just here. This is, these are the upcoming things. Take a look at that. You can take a screenshot of this if you want to and let people know. But now we're opening this up for questions. You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question, or you can type it into the chat bar. And I will open up this chat. I can see it here. So go ahead and talk if you have a question about your garden, which is fun because here we are in November. Who's gardening in November? That's a question I have for you guys. A lot of people don't. Most people don't. We did. We did the last three days. Perfect. Let's hear about it. <laughs> I had to fill up my roses to protect them. I planted garlic yesterday. Awesome. And, um, today, while I've been filling up my roses, I've been finding, um, oh, what do you call those little onions in Missouri that go everywhere? Um, so. No, not shallots. The, the little, the little tiny. Um, at the top of the plant, when it goes to seed, it turns oh, yeah. into yeah, like a walking onion. Called? Yeah, that's a what? that's a yeah, the walking what? onions. That's what they are. Yeah, a yeah, walking. Yeah. yeah, I found a whole bunch of them today. Right that's in great, the Melanie. In the roses. What, what? That's great. I love it. There, uh, I've got uh, a bunch of those on the rock wall in my greenhouse. Fun. Well, I took some, taking some with me back to Utah, but um, um, yeah, so that's what I garden with this week. It's to, tomorrow it's going to be, oh, it's probably below zero now. No, not zero, below freezing right now outside. It's going to be a high of 33 tomorrow. Yeah. And day before yesterday, it was 72 degrees here. Yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. great. It was amazing. Anyway, so gardening in Missouri, you can still do. Yeah. Um, in November. But uh, we have a question. Yeah, so we're getting, uh, uh, <clears throat> we put in a wall in. Uh, and and our 
uh, so that we could flatten the back of our yard in Utah. A portion of it. A portion of it. And so they're going to bring in fill dirt. Uh, that'll have rocks in it and uh, and sand or whatever, so that there, I guess so that there's good runoff. Uh, but then uh, uh, the question I got today uh, from our landscaper was, do you want your uh, dirt topsoil? Topsoil. Do you want it now or in the spring? And so that's the question that I guess I'm asking you. We wanted it a month ago so that we could have done a cover crop. But it might okay. be too late. All right. Yeah. So I don't know that it's really going to matter too much. If you're getting a lot of rain and snow and you're getting it right now, you might have a muddy, sloppy mess. You may want to wait till springtime. Uh, the, in my mind, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter too much because your growing season is mostly in the springtime. So they could bring it in in the spring, put it out there, smooth it out, and then you're going to get it planted and you're going to go for it. It's a little too late now to plant very much of a cover crop. You know, yeah, it is. So I wouldn't worry too much about like trying to get a cover crop in right now because you could go ahead and plant a cover crop as soon as the weather warms up, like, uh, you know, March, April, as soon as your snow melts is when you could plant any kind of wheat, oats, barley, rye, triticale to get a good cover growing on it. So I would just, uh, you know, ask the landscaper, say, what's the price going to be in the springtime? Is it going to go up or go down? Make it a financial decision. <laughs> well, he should give us the financial. He already told us what the whole thing was going to cost, and I feel like we've already. Well, all right, good. Them. Okay. Yeah. Um, but my my regret is that we didn't use one of the one the wall or one of our terraces one side of the terrace, if you know what I mean, the wall of the terrace, um, and do a lollipine. Uh-huh. Yeah. We should well, have done that. Yeah, yeah, it'll be all right. We still have time. The end of the world hasn't come yet. You got time to fix this. <laughs> well, you got to plan it. When you're doing landscaping like this, you have to plan it all in, like the big things. Yeah. But yeah, maybe we still could somewhere. So the other question that we had was how much topsoil should we put on? Yeah. Uh, Six, eight inches. Or more or what? Okay, here's the deal. <laughs> it doesn't matter what topsoil you get coming in. It's probably not going to be super high quality topsoil. Right. And so whatever you get. As long as it's not orchard. Say that again, Melanie. Just as long as it's not orchard. With all the weeds. Yeah, okay, yeah. So just remember, you're gonna have to improve this soil anyway. So even if it was really bad topsoil, you're still gonna have to get your plants out there growing on it really good, your tap roots, your fibrous roots, keep your plants growing year round if possible. You're still gonna have to do all the things that I um, scream about every week on this free class. Uh -huh. uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's a really good soil or not. So, you know, I wouldn't worry. Just get it in there, spread it out. It doesn't matter if it's an inch or if it's 15 inches. So the, the depth of it isn't that big of a deal because I'm here's what's gonna happen. Even if it was really good topsoil and you put on two feet of it out there because it comes in a dump truck and it's completely pulverized and tilled up, and the machine's going to spread it out and, and even it up for you, it's all going to compact anyway. And the big problem, the number one big problem, I've been teaching this for 20 years in every gardening class I've ever done. The number one problem with soil is compaction. And when we till the soil, that's the number one way to compact it. That's what lands yeah. or, or not landscapers, but uh, construction people do that. They will till up the soil where they put highways and that helps to compact it because it removes all of the air out of it. And when you remove the air, your microbes are dead. So it doesn't matter if you think it's a high quality um, topsoil or a poor quality topsoil, that's irrelevant because once you spread it on there and it doesn't matter, like I said, if it's one inch or 20 inches thick, you're still gonna have to 
restore the five spheres of that soil. Your porous sphere and your uh, groutosphere mm -hmm. still has to grow. And you grow that by inoculating it with the compost uh, extract and get those microbes in there and then get your cover oh, crop growing on it. So don't worry about the depth. The depth doesn't really matter. Well, it is going, growing on, um, going on uh, rock and sand and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, well, I mean, if you have big, if you have big twelve-inch rocks in there, and you need to cover those up, then you better put it twenty inches deep, you know. But if your rocks are only like the size of a tennis ball, then you could probably go eight or nine inches and get a nice smooth top. You know, okay, so, so eight or nine inches would yeah, be what so, we should. So tell just them depend. In. Yeah. So we're talking okay. about two things here. The the first thing I was answering was from a soil health perspective. Now we're talking uh -huh. about just the the physical aspect of getting the ground smoothed out. So. Okay, so putting it on top of rocks, which is what we have, yeah. um, and then especially after they bring in fill. Is that what they're doing? They're bringing in yeah, fill dirt. Yeah. They're bringing in fill dirt, and then they're going to put topsoil on top of the fill dirt. So the fill dirt yeah. is going to have rocks in it. And they probably, they, uh, they know how to smooth it out. So that's yeah. not too big of a deal. I mean, that's their business. They'll just do it right, so. Okay, yeah. and so uh, is there anything that we can bring in that will help uh, get the, that soil ready other than, other than planting? Uh, obviously, we're gonna have to plant and maybe the first year or so not have a great uh, season until it, uh, uh, till the soil becomes uh, enriched and with microbes. Well, he just told us to do the compost tea. Yeah. So, so yeah, John. So here's what you want to do. The answer is no. There is nothing else you need to do. All you need to do oh. is get that dirt all spread out the way you want the the landscape to be, and and then and so don't do anything else. Just spread it out. That's it. And then you start in. On your soil health principles of the compost, the and growing the plants. There's nothing else to do. Like you wouldn't want to put anything. Like people sometimes ask me, should I put down a barrier between one layer and another? No, absolutely not, because you want roots to penetrate 50 feet in the ground if they will. Um, other people ask me, um, should I put down a, a six inches of manure between layers of dirt? No, absolutely not. It'll go anaerobic and grow bad guys. Because because uh, ecology, Mother Nature doesn't know what to do with organic matter that's tilled in or under a layer of dirt. Uh, because that doesn't happen in Mother Nature. What happens in nature is that detritus bear forms on the top from uh, plants that get smashed down by herds of animals or by leaves that fall off of trees and settle at the, on the ground. And then the snow covers them up and begins to decompose them, which is what happens in a compost. So yeah, there's nothing to do. Once once it gets, you get the dirt in there, then you just start getting your compost going and start growing your plants. Okay. So when you plant a plant, you put compost around it? Well, no, just inoculate the entire start. area with a compost extract. Well, I mean, okay. you, you can so put some compost around a, like a potted plant, but not necessarily, but you would put a detritosphere around it. So you could take, you wouldn't even need a finished compost. You just put a like the wood chip mulch that you've heard me talk about before. You know, if, you, okay. if you're planting trees or plants out there that are perennials, you could put four to six inches of wood chips around. But that, yeah, that's what you do once you're planting. Okay. So we'll wait till spring, as yeah, long we'll as he'll bring it. I've heard them say, "Oh, well, we can't bring this in. The ground's too wet." You have to okay, wait. Maybe you better get it May. now, man. If your ground's we'll frost now, get it now while so it's not too muddy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you okay. think they're gonna be waiting until July and you want it in or by May or by even May, April, all done by April, then and they're gonna be waiting around and you're waiting on them and you're frustrated because yeah. they didn't get it. You better get it this fall. Well, that's what happened to us. They said that they would have it done by. Um, before the second week of October, when they shut off our water, um, 
you know, that's one thing you guys have, you've got a stream. Um, but they do shut off our water on the 15th of October and, and we wanted ground cover and everything in and everything done. And they just finished the wall this week. So uh, I, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's when, how will he do it when he says go. he's going to? It's kind of iffy. Okay, what did you say? Uh, what was that you just said? I don't know what I said. I already said it, so I forgot. Sorry. Okay, is there anybody else on this call who has a question tonight? Uh, I do. Go ahead, Zeke. So um, I have a question about fruit trees. So I'm getting a whole bunch of fruit tree ideas and I'm, I'm planning on planting a moderately sized orchard here in a, just over probably two years from now. And so I'm trying to get everything ready. Um, and I know that in the past you've talked about transplanting your trees from pot. And you said not to put in any kind of real mulch or compost in by the roots of the, the like the root ball when you're taking it out of the pot and putting it down. But I want to open up the genetics of my uh, my fruit trees, and I want to be doing a lot more than just uh, buying, you know, pre-potted plants. I, mean, I actually want to save a whole bunch of seeds from different trees that I know I like. Try and open up my genetic bottleneck there, and so I, I'm planning on planting a lot of things from trees as well as taking a few cuttings from trees that I know I already like. And so I'm wondering when you're starting trees in pots for the first time, um, should you follow that same rule about avoiding, um, about avoiding putting any kind of, uh, you know, compost or, or mulch type stuff into your pots when you're planting your seeds? Or is it a good idea? I'm just not sure, you know, should I just go get some dirt and bake it and make sure it's sanitized? <laughs> Okay, let me let me ask a clarifier. Are you talking about what to make for a potting soil that you're going to put in your pots, or are you yes. talking about when you take the the a ten foot tree out of a pot and you plant it, you transplant it into your growing, like your pasture where you're going to have an orchard? What are you saying? So I, I'm pretty confident with taking out my ten foot tall trees. Uh, mostly, what I'm asking about is uh, preparing potting soil to plant my okay. seeds and yeah and my yeah cuts. okay okay yeah so you what you're going to want to do is just make a really good well-drained potting mix so you would never want to take uh just like garden soil and put it in a pot and try to grow a tree it's not going to work very good the one thing in the last hundred years that has been really great for um horticulture is the fact that we have learned from that science of horticulture how to make a really excellent um, potting soil that and your plants will thrive in it when they're very young and then you can go ahead and transplant it so there would probably there's probably a hundred great recipes on the internet if you just got on google and searched some of the keywords would be something like how to make the perfect potting mix for fruit trees. And, uh, you know, and then just start reading and learning about that. But off the top of my head, I can just tell you, if you got some clean sand, like you don't want sand from the ocean, the beach, because it has too much salt in it. But you want builder's sand, like a bricklayer would make up a masonry with lots of sand in it. So get some uh, just clean sand. And so one third sand, and then one third peat moss, and then one third um, halfway decomposed bark, like a pine bark that does not smell like pine needles anymore, or because the that has all the essential oils have gone away. And so that would be a good mix for trees. But you know, I mean, there there could be somebody that has a lot better mix than that for trees. But that's a very common mix for trees peat moss sand and and bark or uh, you could even do half peat moss half sand you get that? so that's uh that's kind of did that help did that make sense i think so i think so so you're saying that even if i have a uh because one of my things i've been trying to do is get a really really fungus heavy uh garden soil in one part of my garden and i i think it's much more fungus than bacteria yet 
but you're saying it, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to mix that in, even though that the trees uh, like a high fungus environment, right? Well, here again, I'm not sure quite what you're asking. I could answer that in two ways, because you said mix it in. So are you talking about mixing mixing something into the dirt of where you're going to put your orchard to get it ready um, for your trees later? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm talking about the pot. Yeah, just just go online, look up a really good, uh, you know, go. In fact, look up Stark Brothers Nursery. Give those guys a call. Find their phone number. They're probably the top tree producer, fruit tree producer in the world. At least they used to be. I haven't talked to them for 25 years. Maybe they've gone downhill, but they used to be the leader in the entire world. Give those people a call. You'll have to talk to somebody besides the person that answers the phone, though. But Stark uh, Brothers? Yeah, Stark. S-T-A-R-K. Stark. They're in Missouri. I think they're near St. Louis. But call them on the phone and say, what's the best um, potting mix for growing trees in pots? But don't, but call 20 different places. One really good place is the horticulture department of universities. You start looking up um, university horticulture departments, and in their websites, they're going to have potting mixes all over the place. Look up Cornell, you look up Purdue, look up Northwest Missouri State, look up. Oh, that's where I went to college. So <laughs> anyway, there's a uh, look up Oregon State. Who who else is big into horticulture? Who are the big horticulture colleges? I'm trying to think. I know Oregon State's one of the best, but they're going to have really great recipes of a uh, good potting soil. Utah State probably so good. Yeah, Utah State's more agronomy than horticulture, though. They're more about forages and cattle and sheep and stuff like that. Okay. I mean, I'm sure they have a great horticulture program. I'm, in fact, I know they do. Yeah. So, so we planted our fruit trees on a slope, and the uh, and the uh, uh, landscaper has said, "I could dig your fruit trees, and uh, uh, and flatten the flatten the land, and then replant them." What do you think of that? No. How old are your fruit trees? Three years One old. Year old. No, next year they'll be two. Yeah, we planted them this year mainly. Okay, so they're super young. You might be able to get yeah. away with it. It just depends what you want. Why do we want to do uh, that? It might kill your trees. There's probably yeah. there's probably a 30% chance the tree could die, depending yeah. on how good your landscaper is. If your landscaper is a great um, landscaper and doesn't know very much about trees, he might kill them for you. Yeah. But if he's super, super good with horticulture and he knows the trees and he digs them really slow and he has the right equipment to keep a giant root ball around him and he puts burlap around him and doesn't let that root ball fall apart. And do there's, you know, that increases your opportunity to keep those trees alive. It just depends right. on what they know. So Don't we want it on kind of a slope anyway for drainage? You talked about that in our one of our classes on trees yeah um, how much how how big a land are we talking you're it's just, not that much of a slope down there well it's about 15 uh, 18 feet uh, wide wide and uh a cement uh, six, uh 60 70 feet long a cement yeah. block on one side cement block wall and then the uh, hoa cement yeah, um, yeah. so there, there's not with that small of a piece of land there's probably not a lot you can do about drainage whatever you've got there and that is probably what you're dealing with um uh, air drainage is usually the biggest for late spring frosts that are going to kill your blossoms so the slope is super good for that um, as far as drainage for um, water um, that's going to happen if you get the right microbes in the soil so, because those microbes are going to break up hard pans so you get good drainage. So that's all soil health management. 
Yeah, and John was thoughtful enough to plant some things around the trees too. So it's putting some some nutrients in the um, in the soil around the fruit trees. Yeah, that's perfect. And that you all want, you want as much diversity there. as you can get. That's right. That's yeah. Sounds so good. okay, so then uh, tell me about uh, uh, what what you were saying. Explain to me again. Uh, putting it on a slope helps uh, uh, helps uh, uh, blossoms. Uh, it helps. Quite the, yeah. So there's two kinds of drainage, and they both deal with fluids. One is water, and that's not the one I'm talking about. The other fluid is air. So the atmosphere and the air. In the springtime, you've had five weeks of super beautiful spring weather and all the blossoms open up. And then all of a sudden here comes um, Father Winter rearing his ugly head and he's gonna bring in a frost and it'll kill all your fruit blossoms. Well, cold air will flow downward. It flows down, down, down into the into the valleys and so you want to have your fruit tree on the hillside on the That's slope so that the air is moving because if the if the air stops moving if that flow stops then that cold air will settle and, and the little frost particles will kill your blossoms so if you if you're in the bottom of a of a valley then that's a bad place to put fruit trees. You always want them on the, the slope of the hill. And a lot of times you want them on the top of the hill too, but in the Western United States, if we say put them on the top, then people misunderstand that and, and they put them at 12,000 feet. Well, that's not gonna work. Because <laughs> a lot of the foothills just keep sloping up forever. And so, so, so you want them on the slope, but not in the bottom of the valley. That way, as the air drains, you don't get the frosts that kill your blossoms in the spring. And that is very interesting, very interesting because a lot of the fruit orchards where we live are on the slope of a hillside. You can yeah. see the rows going up the hill. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, that, that makes total sense. We just have a, a four foot wall on one side where the fruit trees are. So the blossoms are the top so the trees are still up high good, good. Um, yeah and so i yeah that's good to know we don't need to have them take our trees out and disturb our soil that we started building already um yeah, okay that, 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 the slope. That, yeah. you're just gonna have to weigh the pros and cons of that to see what you want to do yeah no um, i i i'm with you um i do have a question is Lucille brought something up the other thing i did this week was i took when I had to cut the roses a bit, you cut them down a bit um, for wintering. Um, I took cuttings from the roses so that I could try try to see what happens starting um, baby roses from the cuttings, not baby roses, but little seed roses. What do I want to say? I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, like to get plant. the cuttings yeah. to grow. Yeah. 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 And so uh, the medium I used was just a potting mix but I used half of it was perlite. So I used a potting mix and perlite because it said it had to be well draining. Yeah, and yeah. And I dipped it in hormone solution and then I put it into the little tiny pots um, and they say in about a week or two, the roots will grow. Is that the right kind of um, mix for, and maybe Ezekiel may want to be doing some of these too because he talked about taking cuttings. Um, is that a good cutting mix or should I add something to it? No, that sounds pretty good. That's good mix. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, when I was telling Ezekiel about the sand, so yeah. perlite and sand are going to do the same thing. The water is going to awesome. flow through it very quickly. The reason I never um, recommend perlite is because if you're going to do anything uh, like significant size, like Ezekiel is probably going to do like 50 pots big pots for trees right and it might cost him 700 to 1200 dollars <laughs> to buy enough perlite to do that right and, and for with sand you can just grab a, a couple of pickup loads of sand and you know for 25 30 bucks so it becomes a financial thing because a big bag of perlite i mean back i oh. haven't got perlite for probably 
10, 15 years. The last time I did, it was $25 for a big giant. Oh, the big, the big, big bags that are you get yeah. from a horticulture place. You can't, they don't even yeah. sell those at places like Home Depot. And so that's yeah. just way too expensive because to do that many that Ezekiel's probably want to do, um, he'd need maybe 30 bags. So it could get really expensive, you know. Yeah, they were over $30. I want to say they were $37 a bag this year for yeah. those great big bags that you're talking about. And there was one nursery in Utah that in Utah Valley there that carries them. Okay. Um, cool. But I just yeah. happened to have a, a small bag here and I said, oh, I'll use this. So just a spur of the moment thing. So I did do more planting than just the just the garlic. I've been playing in the dirt for three days now. So it's been fun. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I have a quick follow-up, for... just real fast. Um, can yeah, you go, go over one more time the concept of the air drainage? I don't think I've heard you talk about that before, and I am intrigued. It's not something I've like heard of before. Okay, imagine a landscape with a, with a mountains, foothills, valleys, and then you have a really low valley, okay? Just pretty much mm -hmm. anywhere in the Western United States, and you run into that terrain. What happens is hot air rises. And when the warm air rises, something has to fill in. And so cool air travels downhill into the valleys. So that's it. I mean, that's the science of it. That's what way makes the wind blow, basically. But even on a on a very non windy day, <laughs> what will happen is well, it's the same thing that happens. But you may not even feel a breeze, but the air is just very gently moving. If you had a feather out there and held it up, you, the, all the little tiny pieces of the feather would be going one direction because the air is moving, even though you hardly feel the breeze. If you can keep your trees in an area that is uphill from the very bottom of the valley, you're gonna have warmer temperatures than if you're in the bottom of the valley. I have a neighbor here close by and he has a bunch of greenhouses. He's just across the mountain in Star Valley. And he's in probably the coldest area in Northern Nevada. There's people who live about a thousand feet above him and they have warmer um, temperatures at nighttime, even though they're at a higher elevation, because they are not in the bottom of the valley, because the cold air will settle in the bottom of the valleys. So it's it can be as much as 10 degrees colder in the bottom of the valley than where my other neighbor lives, who's who's almost a thousand feet. I think he's probably 800 feet higher. Well, they generally have a difference if the coldest nights of about 10 degrees and that valley is a little bit colder. Awesome, thank you. You bet. Okay, we're almost done with our time for tonight, but I'll take another question if anybody has it, especially if there's somebody who has a question who has not asked the question, please do so now. Did we have a class last week? No, we didn't. We did not have a class. Okay. And and when uh, th Thanksgiving is on Thursday, so we will not have a class on Thanksgiving either. Okay. Um. So we didn't have one last week, but we had one the week before. Yes. Okay. And that is on right. YouTube. The, it is on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. Perfect. Okay. And next week, will we have one? Um, yeah, I don't know where my calendar is. Is next Thursday Thanksgiving, or do we have one more week? No. Um, we have Thanksgiving another week. Is, yeah, so yeah, we'll be doing one, one next week. Yeah. Now. Yep. I will be okay. on next week. The only time I'm not on pretty much is Thanksgiving, or if we have internet problems. I quite often oh. have internet problems here because I live so far from civilization. Okay. Elon Musk is supposed to fix that for everybody, but I haven't signed up for Starlink, so I don't know. 
<laughs> right. I'm coming along to do that when I move up there. I'm bringing it with me. <laughs> and so, um, uh, do you use the same uh, link, a Zoom link, every week? No, I haven't. But because I can only schedule like twenty classes at a time. Okay. But oh. so it, but yeah. So I well, have I, to. I was... I have to put on a new link every so often, but for the next yep. eight or nine weeks, it should be the same one. But I put okay, so my I link on Facebook every week, so even though right. it's the same most of the time. Okay, so I've been talking to uh, uh, Tarkio College about how they they can promote your uh, your class, right? And yeah. they're and they're saying, uh, uh, well, probably the best thing or worst thing. Go to your Facebook link and and, and look. That, that uh, problem, yeah. Is. I mean, I can I can put up the link for them. You know, that's the current link. But if like when we run into tech difficulties or whatever, or yeah. if I need to schedule a new class or whatever, the way I let people know is on my Facebook page. So yeah, we just need to make sure they or have access to that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Great question. Thank you for answering our questions. And Ezekiel, you had some really good ones there. I appreciated that. Okay, oh. for sure. Thanks. Thank you guys for being on. And this will be on uh, YouTube. And let your friends and family and acquaintance know about boot camp coming up because I think a lot of people could be benefited by growing a winter garden. So. Um, thank you and good night. Oh, could I ask that question? If you're going to do winter gardening in containers to begin with, seeds in containers, what's the best month to start that? Um, January, February? Um, what would you say, William? The best time to start any garden is when you want to and when you think of it. I've had a lot of people <laughs> say, oh, May is over. I missed the gardening month. That you have to plant everything in May. Well, that's a lie. It, somebody was completely misinformed because I plant stuff every month of the year. So you can plant any time. If you want to have a winter garden in pots, just plant it now. You can plant start in August, September, October, well, I, October December. You can just plant sure. all the time. What I meant was in um, water or milk gallon jugs. You label them, put your seeds in. Sit them outside and watch what happens in the springtime. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's a winter gardening method, unlike sure. what you're going to teach. But um, I was just wondering. So that's good. You can plant anytime you feel like it. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and it depends where you live, you know. Because if you're in Alabama, it's going to be way different than if you're in Alaska. Yeah, my wheat is six inches tall and happy as a songbird. Wow. Yep. All right. Okay, Thanks good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. You bet. Good night, Bye -bye. everyone. Let's see, we were there. They could see.